Today, we're diving into the archives to look at one of the worst scandals in all of academic history that happened in the field of physics. Our subject for today's video is Jan Hendrik Schön, a German physicist who almost faked his way all the way to a Nobel Prize. So Hendrik was a German physicist who specialised in the field of transistors. So in order to fully appreciate the context and the significance of his apparent findings, we first need to explore what transistors are and why they're so important. So if you don't know, a transistor is essentially a very small switch, a switch which allows a current or voltage to flow through it or not. And by very quickly and precisely allowing current to flow through itself, that allows your computer to read that flow of current as either a one or a zero. And so transistors form the basis of modern computing. It's through transistors on an integrated circuit that we're able to have PCs, iPads, phones, the very thing that you're watching this video on, whatever it might be, we all use transistors every single day. It turns out transistors are actually the most reproduced invention in human history. There are more transistors in the world than wheels. So as you can tell, transistors are incredibly useful for humankind and well, just the upkeep of our modern economy. But in order to continue improving in our computing power, we've become very reliant on one very specific element, silicon. Silicon is great. In its crystalline form, it allows us to make transistors extremely small and fit a lot of them onto an integrated circuit. And we've been able to continually do that in order to increase our computing power. Rather famously, we've been roughly speaking doubling the number of transistors that we fit on a single integrated circuit, essentially doubling our computing power. This is often called Moore's Law, named after Moore, who was the co-founder of IBM and who invented this idea of our computing power doubling every two years. But the problem with only using silicon as our main material for transistors is that, well, it has a limit. As you pack more and more transistors into a small space, the integrated circuit simply gets too And at very high temperatures, silicon begins to break down. And so as a result of that, people predict that, well, Moore's law has to come to an end and that we can't keep doubling our computing power every two years. The silicon would simply get too hot. But what if we could find an alternative to silicon? If we look at the periodic table, basically any element that is in group 14, the same one as silicon, could theoretically be used to make transistors. And you'll see right above silicon, there's an element called carbon. In theory, you can turn carbon into a carbon crystal and use it as an alternative to silicon. It'd be way easier to produce and potentially allow for Moore's law to continue even further. And thankfully, one very talented physicist was able to turn carbon crystals into a working transistor. And that person was Jan Hendrik Schoen. So let's meet Hendrik. Hendrik Schoen was one of the greatest minds the world of physics had seen for years. He could actually go by his first name, Hendrik and we would all know who he was. In the late 1990s, Hendrik is finishing up his PhD at the University of Konstanz in Germany. But in 1997, Hendrik gets a call that will completely change his life. You see, there's this lab in America called Bell Labs, and it's arguably the most important innovation hub in human history. In fact, it was at Bell Labs where the very first transistor was invented back in 1947. But 50 years after that first invention, there was another scientist at Bell Labs who decided that he wants to work on a new transistor, one that is carbon-based rather than silicon-based. That person was Bertram Batlogg, a very famous physicist in his field who had been working for many years on the idea of superconductors, but decided to pivot away from superconductors and move towards transistors. So in order to start his work on transistors, Batlogg needed to put together a team which could help him. So there was him, the superstar physicist, and he decided to recruit firstly, a guy called Christian Clock, who was an expert in making crystals. And then Batlog and Clock needed a semiconductor guy, somebody who was used to working with transistors. And so because nobody at Bell Labs had the right specialty and was available at that time, Clock decided to reach out to his old university, the University of Constance, to see if they had anybody who would be suitable to come work at Bell Labs. Now the person who Clock reached out to was actually Hendrik's supervisor, who first recommended two other PhD students ahead of Hendrik. But those two PhD students had different engagements, and so by just a mere coincidence and sheer luck, Hendrik was chosen and offered the internship at Bell Labs, the internship of a lifetime. Now, when Hendrik first started at Bell Labs, he was still finishing his PhD and so was moving a lot between Germany and America and was really publishing at a normal researcher's pace. But it seemed like Hendrik wasn't satisfied with this normal pace of publishing. It was frustrating for him to do this experimental work and not get the results that he was looking for. And what he quickly realized was that not all of his work that he was doing, not all of his experiments would end up getting published because 
as we know and as we've explained on this channel before, if you get a null in your experiment, your chance of getting published drops dramatically, especially not in a top journal like Nature or Science. So after two or three years of Hendrik publishing in a normal way, he decided to change his process in the year 2000. Rather than follow the normal scientific method of hypothesize, run an experiment, write the results, Hendrik decided to do his research in reverse. He would first decide what results that he wanted to see, and then he would invent an experiment that would justify the results that he just got, and then write up the paper and submit it. And this change of process turned out to be remarkably productive for Hendrik. He was able to publish papers thick and fast, and his results were beautiful, incredibly neat, almost as if they were, you know, theoretical results rather than real ones. At the peak of his productivity in 2001, Hendrik was publishing one paper on average every eight days. I lived with people at university who would do their dishes less frequently than Hendrik was publishing. And what's more, the papers that he's putting out aren't duds. They're getting published in some of the top journals in the world, like Nature and Science. Journals which are so prestigious that most scientists would celebrate just having one paper in either of them. And Hendrik in his early 30s already had 16 papers in Nature and Science. One of those papers, most notably, was his paper on pentacene, a new carbon-based crystal that he had created with Clock and Batlog that apparently could be used as, you guessed it, a semiconductor, a transistor. If this paper were true and pentacene could really be used as a carbon-based alternative to silicon-based CPUs, that would completely change the world of computing. It would allow Moore's law to continue and revolutionize the modern economy and our computing power as a whole. The discovery of this alone would be Nobel Prize worthy. And off the back of this paper, which by the way received 300 citations, a lot of people were pitting Jan Henrik Schoen for the next Nobel Prize. But Schoen didn't stop there. He claimed remarkable ability to turn his organic compounds, his carbon-based crystals into anything from lasers to superconductors and even molecular scale transistors. Those are transistors that are so small that they're made by placing individual atoms in a way that creates a transistor. I mean, if you're able to make transistors that small, that means the number of them that you could fit on an integrated circuit is absolutely huge. And the potential for computing is again, world changing, economy changing, computer changing, definitely Nobel Prize worthy. And while well, he was getting very famous off the back of it. But with all of that fame and attention also comes critics. And some people began to doubt his work. Obviously just the sheer volume of work that he was pumping out just seemed completely unrealistic. But it wasn't just the quantity of work that was raising alarm bells, it was also the results themselves. They just seemed far too perfect. They looked like theoretical results rather than ones from actual experimental physics. But on top of all of that, the biggest red flag was that nobody was able to replicate his findings. A few of these physicists even reached out to Hendrik directly, asking him what they were doing wrong with their experiment and why they couldn't recreate the incredible results that he he got. And his standard answer to all of these requests was always, it's my aluminium oxide. Apparently he would use this very thin layer of aluminium oxide in his transistor setup, and that was the secret to him being able to create these amazing results that he was getting. Now, aluminium oxide is not some super rare material. It's something which a lot of experimental physicists could get their hands on. But for some reason, no one in the entire world was able to get aluminium oxide of the quality that Hendrik had in his lab. Now, all of this is fishy and incredibly frustrating for the other physicists in his field. But there is still no smoking gun. There's nobody out here able to outright accuse him of academic fraud. That was until two other researchers at Bell Labs discovered something about his papers. Those two researchers were Julia Xu and Lin Lu, two other researchers at Bell Labs who were trying to file a patent for their own work. Now, in order to file a patent, you first have to justify why your invention is unique and deserves to be patented. And so as part of that process, they were looking through papers in relevant fields fields that are, you know, closely related to what they were trying to file a patent for. And as part of that process, they came across some of Hendrik's papers. Particularly, they were looking at Hendrik's papers about the molecular transistor, the tiny, tiny transistor that could completely change the world. And when they were looking at his paper, they discovered that two of the graphs in his paper looked exactly the same. The curve was not only the same shape, but everything down to the noise was exactly the same. That's the little squiggles and bumps along the line, exactly the same. And supposedly these two graphs were done on two different devices on two different days, but yet these graphs seemed identical. Now, according to experts in the field, there is absolutely zero chance of this happening by chance. The fact that these two lines are identical is a clear indication of duplication. So 
Julia and Lynn, being the good scientists that they are, immediately reported their findings to their supervisor. And quickly, this news spread to a small number of relevant people who were interested in Schoen's molecular transistor work. That included one person called Paul McEwen, who ended up finding a third graph that also showed the exact same pattern, down again to the noise. And eventually, as this news spread around this very tight-knit community, it made its way to Lydia Son, a researcher at Princeton University. Now it turns out Son had been suspicious of Hendrik for some time, and she'd already spoken to a couple of her colleagues about how dodgy Chun's work seemed to be. And out of all of the people who were aware of these duplicate graphs, it ended up being Lydia Son who was responsible for reporting Chun's work to Nature, the journal that published the paper originally. Now, as a quick sidebar to Shun's main story, the reason why Lydia Son was chosen as the one to report these findings to Nature was because out of all of the researchers who knew about the duplicate graphs, she was the only one who didn't have an active submission to Nature. So in other words, the other researchers were too afraid to report Shun's work in Nature to Nature because they were worried that would jeopardize their own chances of their paper being published in that journal. Now just think about how worrying that is, that researchers have smoking gun evidence of academic fraud but they're too scared to whistleblow and tell the journal about it because it might jeopardize their own career. Just think about what would happen if Lydia Son wasn't brave enough and available to do this whistleblowing for them. Like how much longer could Schoen's fraud go on before somebody eventually reported him to nature? It just seems totally messed up incentives wise. So after all of this, Bell Labs sets up their own investigative committee to look into Schoen's work. And this consists of a lot of very high profile physicists. So after a few months of investigating, they finally released their report on Schoen's work. And the conclusions that they come to are absolutely fascinating. Firstly, Schoen was accused in the report of nine counts of data substitution, nine counts of unrealistic precision, and six counts of contradictory physics. And on top of that, the report looked into the 20 co-authors of Hendrix, and they found that of the 20 co-authors, three of them should be considered principal or primary co-authors because of how many papers that they did with Schoen. Those three co-authors were Batlog, the supervisor, Christian Koch, the crystal wizard, and Zinan Bao, who actually didn't do as many papers as Clock and Batlog did with Hendrik, but she was the one who co-authored a lot of the papers on the molecular transistor, where a lot of the accusations ended up being. And what the report said, and what is completely baffling to me, is that none of these co-authors, Batlog, Clock, or Bao, ever saw Hendrik actually measure anything. Batlog, the supervisor, was just kind of there to listen to Hendrik's findings, give him some feedback advice, but always at a distance. Clock was just there to make the crystals, and then he gave the crystals to Hendrik to do all the measurement, so he was never there when the measurement was actually happening. And a similar situation with Bao, where she would simply make the molecular compounds, hand them to Hendrik, and then Hendrik would do the measurements, behind closed doors. And so all of that implies that Hendrik was essentially doing this fraud on his own and that the other three are largely, you know, ignorant and innocent. But I'm thinking, how is that even possible? Especially when it comes down to the laser that Hendrik made. Like if somebody made this revolutionary laser in their lab and they had this, you know, incredible beam of light in their lab and it was, you know, going to completely change the world, surely that you would want your co-authors to come to the lab and okay, hey, look, go <laughs> come look at my amazing laser that I made in my lab. You know, it's absolutely baffling to me that none of these co-authors saw him even make the laser. So what happened next? Well, after the report came out, Schoen was obviously fired from Bell Labs. And not only was his reputation tarnished in the academic community, but the New York Times wrote a piece about him, and so his reputation was tarnished in the public eye as well. And in terms of his publication history, Hendrik has had 32 papers retracted, which places him at number 22 on Retraction Watch's leaderboard of scientists with papers retracted. That means he has less papers retracted than Diedrich Stapel, who we talked about in a previous video. But there's an argument to be made that Schoen's work was potentially more significant than Stapel's, and so that makes him worse in terms of the fraud, but I'll let you guys decide that. So what are the takeaways from this story? To me, there are two main conclusions. The first conclusion is that academic fraud is not limited to social sciences. You know, given my background, I've talked a lot about fraudsters in the world of behavioral science and social science and some of you in the comments say oh yeah well obviously social science is nonsense science and that would never happen in a real science like physics well here we are this is Jan Hendrik Schoen one of the worst academic fraudsters in history and his field was experimental physics. It really doesn't get much more of a hard science than experimental physics. And well, yeah, there's still academic fraud there too. But the other takeaway from this story is who is responsible for academic fraud? You know, this is a question that people have been asking ever since this story first broke in the early 2000s, because obviously, you know, Hendrik has to be responsible. He's the one who's driving the fraud. He's the one who's driving the lies. He's the one who is fabricating the data. But what about the other people who are involved, right? What about Batlog, his supervisor on so many of these papers? How come there's not more responsibility 
responsibility placed on him for not tracking his underlings work more carefully. What about the peer review system? How come this wasn't caught in peer review when people are looking through his papers, especially on a paper that was supposed to be, you know, so revolutionary for the world that would completely change the world of computing? How come there wasn't more scrutiny when it comes to the data in his work? And finally, what about the journals, right? Nature and science are supposed to be these prestigious journals that we can look up to to publish good quality, amazing research, and yet they're publishing this absolute garbage nonsense data in their work and is just getting through the system like no problem. Like I said, Shun had 16 papers published between these two major journals. Should they also be held responsible for this? You know, 20 years later, people still look at Nature and Science as two of the most prestigious journals in the world, despite them having a long history of publishing garbage like this. But I'm interested to know what you guys make of this whole situation. Who do you think should be held responsible for Hendrik's work? But before I go, I just want to give a special shout out to another channel called Bobby Broccoli. If you guys don't know who he is, he's another YouTuber who does much longer form content where he goes really deep into a few specific topics, including a three-part super series on Jan Hendrik Schoen, which he made about three years ago. Those videos are amazing, and I use them as major sources for writing this video, so I've linked them in the description box below. Go check out his channel if you want to learn more about Jan Hendrik Schoen's case. There's a lot more detail that I had to omit in order to keep this video kind of short, so you know, go check him out. All right, so thank you guys so much for watching. Subscribe if you want to learn more about the problems of academia, because that's <laughs> what we're going to be talking about for the foreseeable future. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.